Hi everyone. Um, I'm already feeling very inferior here because I'm in a room full of developers and I couldn't get this screen to work between the computer and the thing. So, um, so I'm, I'm not going to be able to see it on my screen, which means I can't do a couple of little bits of the talk, but that's all right. Um, I, this talk was called Building a Software Company, and I thought I need to do myself a bit more justice and you know, present, present a good front. So I've, I've changed it to Building a Great Software Company. Uh, so my name's Neil, I'm from Lexable. We're a, a small but exciting software company um, in Cardiff, we're just based in Cate's. Um, so what is going to happen is I'm going to tell you a little bit about my story um, and then what eventually became the business's story um, and just a few lessons that I learned along the way um, about what a business is and what software is and all that kind of stuff. And then um, I thought it was, only, it was only fair to stick some code on the end as well. Um, so just, just so I feel like I fit in with the rest of you. Um, so this story starts with me aged 15 looking like this. Um, so that's, that's, that's how it all started. Um, I, I'm dyslexic and I struggle with uh, spelling particularly um, and when I was doing my GCSEs I got really frustrated with all those red underlines that would appear every time I made a spelling mistake. Um, so I thought I don't really know anything about this kind of stuff but I'm going to go away and try and work out how to write a piece of software to get rid of those red underlines. Um, and I developed a very crude little piece of software that I hacked together um, with no knowledge initially um, and uh, it would automatically correct my spelling as I typed um, using a keyboard hook so whether I was in window whether I was in word or emails or anywhere it would, it would always correct for me um, now the reason I've got this picture up on here is that um, I, I became famous when I got my GCSEs, I actually ended up in the local newspaper. It was sort of dyslexic boy has achieved some GCSEs, so well done. Uh, that was the pinnacle of my career. Um, um, so I, I then, sort of skipping on ahead a little bit, um, went to university, did a degree in psychology, sorry, um, and I, alongside that, turned this little piece of software that I developed into something that I could go out and sell. and potentially start to make some money out of. So I graduated 2009, um, set up Lexable um, and released Global Autocorrect as a proper piece of software. Um, so I, 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 I'm going to go through a few lessons that I learned, there's only four of them, don't worry, um, as, as, I, as I built up the, the software and, and the company. Um, and, and I started off, um, I, I have I thought I didn't really have any credibility um, going in and saying, well, I, you know, I, I've, not had a, I've not had traditional training in software development, um, I don't have any background in business. But, but one thing I did find um, that really worked, that was my angle for credibility, was when I was going and showing people um, this software and saying, look, you really need to buy it, um, the people who, who I was trying to convince were um, professional assessors who see people with dyslexia in, in universities and they see them every day and the dyslexic student comes in and says, I've got dyslexia, um, what can you do to help me? And it's the job of these assessors to um, find support and software to, to provide to these, uh, to these students. So um, my credibility actually came from I had been one of those students. In fact, when, you know, when we launched the product in November, it was only sort of three or four months before that that I had been a student. So um, when I was going and speaking to these assessors, I, I had this credibility because I could say, well, actually, um, I am the same people. I, I am those people who, who come in and see you, and I know this works, so that, that's really good. And that actually worked, and that made a big difference to me um, and, and how well I could sell it. Uh, but th there are other ways. I mean, you know, you hear people say, you know, I've, I've just, I did work for this company that everyone's heard of before, and now, I, uh, and now I've set up on my own. Um, a, a good friend of mine who set up a, an internet marketing company, um, he actually wrote a book um, that was about internet marketing, and he managed to get that as one of the uh, one of the core texts on the Charter Institute of Marketing course. So that was his credibility. But I think if if you're going to set up a business, getting that credibility. Um, so that people take you seriously, whatever your angle is going to be really important. And it was for me, anyway. Um, so, uh, almost a year later, sort of uh, between sort of summer and October 2010, um, I'd, I'd been doing the business for a year and I'd originally thought, well, I'll, I'll give it a go for a year 
uh, because it's it's a bit better. You know, I, I hadn't had a gap year, um, so at least at the end of that year, I could go out and get a real job, and I'd be able to say, well, I, I didn't go trotting around the globe. I tried to set up a business and and, and learned a few things from it. Um, but a year later, um, I was skint and failing, um, so it hadn't quite worked out how I how I'd anticipated, um, and. What I realised after sort of you know sitting down and thinking why is this company not working? Why at, at, at that point I was still uh, I, I was getting housing benefit because I wasn't getting enough money in from the business to uh, to to pay my rent and to feed myself. It really wasn't a nice place to be in. Um, but the lesson that I learned after sort of looking at right what am I doing? Why is this business not making money? It turns out I'd forgot to sell. Um, so I'd spent most of this first year. Um, working on the product, making it even better, fine-tuning all the features, because that was sort of the easy bit, is sitting, sitting in an office, um, focusing on this tiny little bit of code that didn't really make any big difference to the business, um, was a lot easier than getting on the phone and calling people and going and doing demonstrations day after day, travelling around the UK. Um, so that's, that's what I learnt there, was don't forget to actually sell the product that you're making. Um, Jump ahead a couple of years, um, because I haven't got very much time to cover the whole of the business so far. Um, I actually employed somebody, um, which is very exciting. Um, so the business was actually generating enough, you know, I, I wasn't on housing benefit anymore. You know, I, I could actually afford to eat occasionally, um, and I could also afford to take somebody else on. So it was all very exciting. Um, one of the problems, though, was although, although the business was making money, um, I was extremely stressed and overworked and overwhelmed. Um, so I had a million things to do. I was working far too long hours. Uh, I was very, very unproductive at that point. Um, so I employed somebody to basically say, I'm really stressed, so here's a load of the stuff that I don't have time to do. You do it. Um, and it turns out that's not a great way to motivate somebody. Um, <laughs> luckily, um, the, guy, the guy who I had employed was uh, a bit more patient, um, and sort of we worked together for me to learn how to... How to how to work with somebody. Um, so he, he sort of, he, he took quite a lot of my initial, um, you know, I'm stressed and overworked, here's a load of stuff that I can dump on you. Um, and he did that and then, you know, we brought those stress levels down a little bit. Um, and then as that developed, I, I learned that really what you need to do is give somebody whole areas of responsibility. And I mean that seriously, not just um, not just say, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll give you responsibility for this small thing that doesn't really matter, and I'll also be watching over your shoulder while you do it. But I mean real responsibility, you know, saying, um, can you be in charge of the website? Can you be in charge of this kind of stuff? And then discuss objectives, what they're going to do with it, um, but then really leave them to get on with it and report back to you as, as to how it's going. Um, so that was my lesson number three, is give people real responsibility. Um, so since then, uh, we've built a great team now. Uh, so this is us, this is Lex Abel. Um, it's not actually us, it's, uh, we, we had an advent calendar that we sent out, a promotional thing. Um, and as part of that, they drew some lovely pictures of us. If you can guess which one's me, then well done, because um, I'm not quite sure it really looks like me. Um, it, it's actually that one just, that one there, that's me. Uh, we've also got in the room uh, both Sean and Tom over there. So if you can see anyone in the room who looks like either of those people, um, then that's them. Um, and really, the, the, one of the things that I've been able to do since uh, taking these guys on is we, we brought somebody else on each time to take an area of responsibility that I was doing. Bear in mind, I was doing everything and probably nothing very well. Um, and gradually, over the last sort of two, two years-ish, it's got to a point where other people are taking on whole areas of responsibility in the business and they're doing it really well. Um, and because I've been able to give over some of that responsibility, um, it's meant that I'm able to start working on the business rather than in the business. Um, and what I mean by that is that as much as possible, I'm trying to sort of take a step back and look at where the business is going um, and what's going on inside the business and sort of just what, 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 can, we, what can we change and improve. Um, and that's only something that I can do now because I've got people who I trust and who are very good at doing what they're doing, having whole areas of responsibility in the business. Um, I do need to just reference that I took that from a friend of mine called James Taylor, who probably took it from someone else as well. 
Um, so March 2014, where we are now, um, there are seven of us in the team, as you saw. Uh, we've got thousands and thousands of dyslexic people using our software around the UK. Um, and we're also now trying to get into uh, corporate enterprise licenses as well. So we've done a little bit of research that shows that people without dyslexia actually get a productivity boost from just having our software running in the background. And we're trying to use that to, uh, to sell large licenses to large companies. Um, and we are very much learning. Um, I mean, you know, it, was, it was only a couple of years that I took on my first employee. Um, and you know, I, there's still a huge amount for me to learn. There's a huge amount for everyone else in the business to learn as well. Um, so that's where we are. Um, a couple of books, audio books, I say, because I don't like reading. So audio books are much better. Um, these are some that I really like. Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, Stephen Covey, Good to Great by Jim Collins. The Lean Startup by Eric Reese and Valve's Employee Handbook. Have any of you read Valve's Employee Handbook? Yeah, a couple of them. Brilliant. It's, uh, it's, I, I wouldn't say it's a Bible because they've got some really weird ideas that I would never implement. But it's as a thought-provoking thing and to get a few ideas of, uh, of, of what things can be like inside a really great company. It's very interesting. Um, so that's enough about the business, and as I promised, here's some code. Now, I haven't written anything interesting in about 10 years, so um, I'm going to sort of jump back to some code that I wrote when, uh, when I was first learning. So I apologise that it's probably got loads of stuff that you don't normally, that you shouldn't have in code, but if you just sort of look past that. This is actually, this stuff's written in a language called AutoHotKey which if you've heard of, you're a very strange person. Uh, but it happened to be when I searched for what I wanted to do it, uh, on a computer, this thing came up first, so I used it. Um, but it's really cool because you can, uh, it's, it's Windows only, I'm afraid, but um, you, can, you can do some quite high level stuff quite easily, really. Um, and a disclaimer, don't do it because this is a really silly idea what I'm just about to show you. Um, can, it, can you guys at the back see this or do I need to make it bigger? Okay. Anyone know what this, this is, an, this is an actual full program. Anyone know what it does? Yes, absolutely. Well done, everyone. Um, you might notice that the sounds are called ouch underscore number dot wav. Um, and this is back in the day when games were all written in a really great way. Worms was fantastic. I don't know if you, any of you ever went into the Worms uh, program directory. and they just all, all of the sounds there are individual WAVs. So if you wanted to change any sounds in Worms, you could. Um, this is, so that's one. This is my second coding masterpiece that, again, I wrote about 10 years ago. So I apologize for the infinite loop and probably millions of other things that are wrong with it. Um, but anyone wants to tell me what this does? This is a bit more complicated. See, this makes me feel really good, because when I'm looking at all your code, it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> and now, finally, you can look at mine, and it doesn't make any sense either. Does it change the text on every button? Absolutely. Congratulations. Um, so, again, I'm just going to have to open this slightly. Um, and that is all the code we're going to go with. So I, c I think that can be the final time that I look at it, and the screen stops working. Uh, and I've gone back to the beginning. This is just so you get a refresher of all the lovely things I've just talked about. Uh, some lovely code. There we go, fantastic. So the lessons I've learned and that I've imparted my wisdom onto you are get credibility. Do not forget to sell it. That's a very important one. Um, give people real areas of responsibility um, and let them go away and wow you. Um, I, I didn't mention that. If, if somebody, when you give them an area of responsibility, does not wow you, then they're not right for the business. Um, and then you found that a lot more quickly than you would if you waited ages before you gave them any responsibility. And uh, try again to work on the business, not in the business, which, as I said, is not my quote. And that's how I finish. Thank you. Any questions? How did you go about finding your person for um, I didn't have very much money, or I, I didn't want to spend very much money, because people are quite expensive. Um, so I looked around at various government schemes that I could get cheap people for. 
Um, and I happened to find one at the time. It was a Go Wales 10-week placement where I had to pay, I think, £250 a week. Um, so I was sort of committed pretty much to two and a half grand for 10 weeks. Um, and I just put it on their website um, and got somebody got somebody who happened to be really good. There, was a lot, there, was a, there were a lot of people who weren't, and I don't know how much of it was just luck that I happened to get somebody who was really good. Um, but since then, um, recruited in lots of different ways. I think every single person who's worked in the, or who works in the company came through a different route. Um, we've had, uh, we've gone through, ne never through recruitment agents, we've had, um, there's a, a company that, that, that we've used called Recruitment Boutique, um, who instead of a recruitment, recruitment agent who might take a couple of grand um, to find somebody for you, they'll, they'll take a couple of hundred quid um, and uh, put your job out on lots of job sites um, and also go through CV databases. They do a lot of the back-end stuff for other recruitment agents. Um, so that was really good. Um, working with universities, um, there are a couple of developers. Um, one, one of them that we got was actually I was working with an academic in university who then decided um, to, uh, to, to take an early retirement package from them and come and work with us. Um, so that was really good. Um, and also through him, one of his, well, his best student ended up being um, our lead developer as well. So there's, th recruiting is one of the most difficult things you will ever do um, as, as, as a business owner. Um, and there is no magic formula to it, unfortunately. Sorry. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, thanks very much. <laughs>